Okay, so uh, I'm used to wearing a target on my back, so I'm going to probably uh, get some, some arrows shot at me for this topic I'm going to discuss. But uh, what I want to talk about is, is based on my observation. This is clearly not science. If, if you are a scientist, you uh, generate a hypothesis, you collect data then to either prove that wrong or right. What I'm going to be doing is sharing the data that I've gathered by observing all these patients I've been treating for the last two years and trying then generate a hypothesis to explain what I've seen. That is not science. So this is opinion about what you're going to hear. Um, just so I qualify that, then later on in the discussion, I'm going to talk about the FDA and the recent advisory and try and pose some questions from a more scientific point of view to understand what may be going on, what we're, what we're dealing with, what we're up against. And obviously, we got the Canadian version uh, very nicely presented by, by Kirsty and I really don't like following her in these. I've been in this position before. It is no fun following you speaking. I can just tell you that. You put me in a bad spot. <laughs> All right. So let's see. So, so why, why have I chosen this topic of jugular dysautonomia? Well, first I kind of have to explain what is the autonomic nervous system. And the best way to understand it is it's the part of your nervous system that you don't think about. It just happens. These things are reflex actions. It's, it's the, the junction between the subconscious and the conscious. So any activity that, that goes on during the, the course of your day that your body's going to do and you're not physically actively thinking about it, it's most likely an autonomic function. So that includes things that we've heard so nicely about um, in terms of the temperature regulation and the ability to go snorkeling to be out in the sun. If you have this disorder, you can't do that. Your body has a thermostat that doesn't work. Part of it is the way the body cools itself is shunting blood back and forth to the extremities. Part of it is perspiration and the ability to, to cool. Um, but that is a autonomic function. And in patients who have this, it's a dysfunction. But it also includes things that we don't typically think about. And, and I can tell you that I didn't really recognize until very recently these types of symptoms which are present in, in patients that I see, and that's the cardiovascular aspect. Low blood pressure is very common with this. I only recently have come to that recognition. Uh, a common complication of the procedure, or I shouldn't say common complication, a complication that we deal with with the procedure uh, is what's called an SVT, it's a tachycardia. And it occurs as soon as we inflate the balloon in the jugular vein. It's like instantaneous. You inflate that balloon, and that's when the SVT will occur. That is autonomic. So things that I didn't recognize, I'm now coming to understand, and I can look back and reflect and say, OK, that makes sense. But these, these functions are things you don't think about. And for patients who have this, they're going wrong. They don't work. What is dysautonomia? Well, that is the term that describes when your autonomic nervous system is failing you. And it can be one symptom, okay? It can just be one individual symptom. Or it can be every one of them. And if it's every one of them, typically this is something that, that you see in children. They're born with this. They, they do not have the ability to regulate all these bodily functions. So this is something that we see in many different disorders. It is not something unique to MS. This is much bigger than that. Okay? Um, it is something that primarily is, is governed by the vagus nerve, which is the nerve that communicates these signals. And in the brain itself, it's primarily a function of the hypothalamus. There is involvement in the brainstem, however, but those are the two big ones, the vagus nerve and the hypothalamus. The things that we recognize in our patients that were going wrong, uh, actually well over a year ago, we actually started to screen our patients for these symptoms, are things that may sound familiar to you. Fatigue, disturbed sleep, brain fog, bowel and bladder issues. Those are the things that we identified our patients having, number one. And number two, when we did the treatment, those are the things that very consistently respond. Those all, as it turns out, are autonomic. So I myself have seen quite a number of patients with this. And this is, this is the thing that you, you take home when you see these patients. They have autonomic symptoms, virtually all of them. I've only had a handful of patients who didn't have autonomic dysfunction symptoms. And those are the ones that I've kind of figured out, hey, I really shouldn't be treating them because they're not going to respond or 
it's going to be very unlikely that they're going to respond. Because when you do this procedure, what you consistently see improve across the board, no matter which center you go to, you see fatigue improve, you see sleep improve, you see brain fog improve, you see thermal regulation improve. It doesn't matter where you go. Those are the things you'll see and hear over and over respond. Yes, we all have patients that we know of that didn't go in walking but left walking. We have patients that had no sensation in their feet or their hands when they, had, when they went for their initial evaluation. When they left, they had that sensation. That happens. It doesn't happen as often as I would like, that's for sure. But consistently, the autonomic nervous system symptoms respond. Well, what's interesting about that is that your neurologists know all about this. In fact, in particular, they are most comfortable, perhaps, and most um, accepting of autonomic dysfunction with Parkinson's. There is a subset of Parkinson's disease where autonomic symptoms predominate. Well, we actually don't treat just MS patients. We treat any neurodegenerative patient. Any patient who has these autonomic symptoms will treat. And so we have treated Parkinson's patients, and they, they also respond in a similar manner. Not necessarily having the, the movement disorders respond, but clearly having the autonomic symptoms respond. That is what we're actually affecting when we do this procedure. There's actually studies out there, published studies, where neurologists, as you can see this quote from one of them, recognize the autonomic component to MS. This is a real part of MS, and it's a recognized part of MS by the neurologists. So I said that this was my opinion, and it, it is my opinion, but there are some interesting things out there that are available, even on the NIH website. That's in the US. Uh, I think it's very, fairly equivalent to what you have here in Canada, but this is the official body when it comes to, to health and medicine. And I'm taking these from their website. They recognize that, first of all, the autonomic system is involved with neurodegenerative disorders, and they, they list actually Parkinson's as one. They also note that there is no cure for dysautonomia. There is actually no treatment, per se, for dysautonomia. If you do have a treatment, it is supportive and symptomatic in nature. It's not directly treating the problem. Going back to my opinion, I think we do have a treatment. So I'm of the opinion that that is what this procedure does. We are treating autonomic dysfunction. We need to prove this, we need to study this, but this could be the treatment for autonomic dysfunction regardless of what disease it may be associated with. It's not just MS is what I'm saying. It's a unique disorder, nervous system disorder, mind you, but it is one that we may have a new treatment that we kind of stumbled upon, really. We thought that we were treating the venous problem that was unique to MS patients and, and perhaps that, that is true. I don't know that that's not true. But maybe this procedure does something far more. We're going to find out. People like you are going to make us find out. We're going to keep pushing. So again, how this relates to this procedure? What is going on? How is it the veins are connected? Well, we certainly know that there's a theory about the vascular theory of MS, we, we clearly, I've been one that says that this venous hypertension in, in the jugular and azygous veins has led to this disorder. And here I am saying that maybe that's not the case, even though I've been one of the biggest cheerleaders of it. Um, I'm not sure. But there's a couple things that at least go through my mind when I try and analyze what this is. So first of all, could it be that there's venous compression from, an, from a jugular vein that has under too much pressure. Is that possible? Sure. That is possible. The only thing that would go against that is that typically when we do a, an evaluation with imaging, such as an MRV, what we see is that the jugular is collapsed. So that doesn't quite add up to me that if the jugular vein is collapsed in the patients who are symptomatic, that venous distension would compress the vagus nerve. Um, the other possibility is that venous hypertension, going back to that theory, is impacting the hypothalamus. Well, that could be. We know that there is venous hypertension present in these patients. We've measured it. The pressure is elevated. Could that be causing some hypothalamic dysfunction, perhaps mediated through the CSF? Sure. 
That, that seems logical. We need to study that. But what if actually it was some intrinsic abnormality, some functional abnormality, something wrong with the vas vagus nerve itself? And when you do this procedure to balloon the vein, you're not really doing anything but squishing that vagus nerve, and the compression is somehow impacting it. Well, let's think about that. When we see our patients, the, the, the key thing we're doing, at least I, I think different than, say, other venous angioplasty, is we're using an extremely high-pressure balloon, the highest available. And the anatomy is such that the vagus nerve travels alongside the jugular, and it's in sheath in this very sturdy structure, very dense fibrous tissue that's going to resist expansion. So if you inflate this high-pressure balloon in this closed space, what's going to give? It's certainly not going to be the artery. The artery is a pretty tough structure. If anything is going to suffer the pressure, it's going to be the vagus nerve. Another data point that supports this is that we do see patients who don't respond to the ballooning treatment because they have compression in the upper jugular region in the stylocervical uh, interval. That compression can be completely occlusive on the jugular vein. If those patients undergo decompression therapy, that space may open perhaps a millimeter. So if you have an eight millimeter vessel and you increase the gap with which it passes to one millimeter, you're not gonna cause a substantial change in the flow through it. Yet those patients respond. Well, we know from other venous compression disorders that nerve compression occurs along with the vein and a millimeter difference on a two millimeter vagus nerve actually would be significant. So there are things that really fit with this vagus nerve as being the culprit. Here's a uh, picture from an intravascular ultrasound, and I don't have a pointer, but there we go. So this structure here, this dark structure, this is the jugular. Here's the carotid right next door, and this is the vagus nerve. So you can see, it's easy to imagine, if you were to inflate this balloon inside the jugular vein, really distend it, it's obviously not distended here, and it's within this dense fibrous sheath, that vagus nerve is going to be compressed. So looking back on our experience over the last year in particular, which is roughly a little over a year ago, we recognized these symptoms as being very consistent from patient to patient. We actually started to collect this information and wouldn't actually bring a patient into the clinic unless they had these symptoms. So we've looked at this data and and again, th these are things that are self-reported, so this is not really hard science, but it's a start. This is a start. And what we found, as I mentioned, were this, was this subset, fatigue, interrupted sleep, brain fog, headache upon awakening. That's, that's actually a really key one, in my opinion. Issues related to the bowel or the bladder and cognitive impairment, otherwise known as brain fog. So those are the things we asked every prospective patient. And we took that information and we distributed it out. And you see that these things are, are fairly common. And you can pretty reliably say if you have three of these symptoms that you're a good candidate for this procedure. So that's sort of the threshold. And the interesting thing is if you take these same patients who have these symptoms, immediately following the procedure in a very short interval, within, within minutes to hours, basically once the sedation's worn off, you can see these changes. We do have patients traveling a great distance, so the actual perception of them may not be immediate because of the fact that travel is involved in different time zones. So your energy level, your sleep may not respond immediately. We also use a lot of hydration, so urinary symptoms may not respond immediately but the, in terms of the perception. But they're there. The effect is immediate. It is autonomic. But these are the things that very consistently, in fact, over 95% of the time, this is what happens. You do this procedure on a patient that has these symptoms, and over 95% of the time, they will respond. So this really points, again, to that something's going on specific to the autonomic nervous system. What's also nice is that these are consistent. They're maintained. They're, they're instantaneous effects that are maintained. Now, there are patients who relapse, and that's the part that I'm sort of struggling with. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about the venous anatomy and how it seems to correlate with relapse. But that's the one part about the autonomic dysfunction that I just 
I can't get a handle on. Um, already talked about that. Well, the other point I will make is that when patients do respond, if you, if you go a good solid six months without a relapse, it doesn't look like you do. I mean, I've had patients now that I've treated over two years that are maintaining the benefit. That's a pretty long time. Thank you. Uh, this slide's a little off, apologize for that. Uh, this is a breakdown in terms of the venous anatomy that we have identified, and you can kind of classify at least the venous anatomy by intraluminal, extraluminal. So what I mean by that is, is there an abnormality within the vein itself, or is there something going on outside the vein that is causing this flow obstruction? And we actually, we actually see that most patients who have this, they do have an intraluminal, something inside the vein, causing the problem, and it's actually the valve. So it's, it's not truly a stenosis, it's not really a narrowing, it's, it's basically a baffle would be the best way to describe it. A valve is, is a structure that is a fold of tissue and we're probably all most familiar with the heart valves, but it's not much different in the vein. And they should move, they should you know, swing open and close as the flow dictates. But if you look at someone who has a CCSVI and you, and you examine in real time, uh, whether it's uh, a venogram or uh, with a um, intravascular ultrasound, the valve doesn't move. It's fixed, it's rigid, it is, it is not a functional device. So it really is a baffle. A baffle is something that increases resistance. And that's what we're seeing with, with the venous abnormalities, increased resistance. The good news about it is ballooning that actually works. It's, it's a very effective and durable treatment. That's fortunate that it's most commonly seen abnormality. What's not so fortunate um, by the way, I noticed you had a valve. That's why you're doing so well. <laughs> um, what is not as common, uh, and it is something we actually don't have a great treatment for, is a narrowing. And that narrowing, interestingly enough, occurs when there is no valve. So it's, it's, it's almost as if there's a developmental problem where the valve doesn't develop normally, nor does the vein where the valve should be. And so it's very small. It creates a stenosis. And we see that 20 to 25 percent of patients. And with that, it also is increased resistance. It's funneling the flow through a smaller diameter. That involves balloon angioplasty, venous angioplasty, and that's not nearly as good a treatment in terms of its durability and effectiveness, uh, excuse me, durability, not effectiveness, uh, at least in our experience, relative to the valvular treatment. And then the, the, the least likely disorder that we see from a venographic point of view is compression, so externally squeezing that vein. That is something that is certainly less than 5% of the patients. The good news is, is if you have it, there are treatments, not necessarily within the vein itself. So we are referring our patients who have this for postural therapy, basically. Opening the space with which the vein passes rather than trying to do something to the vein itself because it is an extrinsic, an external abnormality. And it looks like my video is not gonna load. All right, we'll skip that. Okay, so um, this is just an intravascular ultrasound depicting what I described with this white boundary here and here representing the valve. And, and if you saw the video, you would see that doesn't move. And that should move. That's the valve leaflet itself. It should be going like this, and it doesn't. As I mentioned, when, when you have this particular anatomy, it tends to respond very favorably as far as durability. In other words, you have this procedure done once and you have a fantastic result that doesn't fade. So if you have this, if you have CCSVI, you really want to have valves. It seems to make a difference. Stenosis, on the other hand, we rely on venous angioplasty. And interestingly enough, the results you get with venous angioplasty and CCSVI for a stenotic vein is just what you get if you have an iliac vein that's stenosed, a femoral vein, or any other vein in the body. Venous angioplasty, we know, has a two-month patency of approximately 50%. Doesn't matter which vein it is. Despite what the health minister of uh, Alberta is saying about venous angioplasty, it actually is quite common. We've been doing it for a long time, and it is safe. And it is effective. I mean, 50% patency at two months, while we would certainly like better, that's acceptable in many conditions. So someone needs to address that in Alberta. Um, 
<clears throat> here's a picture of, of a narrow vein, and you can see that on your left, and on the right you can see the narrow vein after a balloon has been inflated. So it does work. You can fix a narrow vein. Admittedly, just venous angioplasty itself is not the best treatment, um, but if you're suffering from this, I think, I think it's fair to say that it's not unreasonable to undergo a procedure that works half the time when you have pretty significant disability. All right, so um, the only thing I'll comment about on this slide is, is that if you are a vascular specialist and you do venous angioplasty, your, your threshold for placing a stent is quite low. In fact, prior to doing CCSVI, I really didn't do venous angioplasty anymore. I stented veins because elsewhere in the body, venous stents have an outstanding patency. In fact, in some respects, venous stents have better patency than arteries. And there's literature to support this. So the idea that you would stent a jugular vein when you do an angioplasty and it doesn't, doesn't respond as well as you'd like is, is not a significant deviation from your traditional practice. In fact, that would be pretty standard. But what we see actually in a jugular vein is stents don't really work so well. And it's because they clot. I think that's more a reflection of the physiology of jugular venous flow than it is that the stents don't work in that vessel. The fact that it is, is that when you are in the supine position, you have maximal flow in your jugular. And so if you have a thrombotic device like a stent and you're laying down all the time, I, I think the results would be fantastic. We tend to live upright though. So we're either sitting or standing for the majority of the day and your flow actually in your jugulars can go to zero in that position. Typically it's just diminished, but it can be zero. And if you have a stent in any vessel with no flow, it's gonna have a hard time not clotting. So it's more a function of the unique physiology of a jugular vein than it is the stent themselves. But at this point, I don't think the stents are something that we should be using. Um, there's an exception to that, and that is if, if you have a venous occlusion, the only way it's gonna stay open with any chance is a stent. So I, I do still stent an occlusion, but fortunately occlusions are, are not a, a common problem. All right, so here's a graphical represent, representation of what that compression is. This is uh, an image from a CT scan, and this white structure here is the first cervical vertebrae. I don't know if you can appreciate the sort of stippled white structure here that is sort of a flattened oval. That's actually a stent. So this is one of my very early cases. This is a patient who had a very severe narrowing in the upper jugular, not even being aware of what the styloid bone is in relative to the jugular vein. I actually treated this with a stent. And this structure right here, this little dot, is the styloid. So you can see that this jugular vein is compressed severely, primarily because the stents in there outlining it. Well, I don't do that anymore, and unfortunately, these are things that we have learned along the way, but this really, I think, demonstrates what's going on with extrinsic compression really well, having that stent in there. As I mentioned, when you have extrinsic compression, we have, we have a therapy that does work. So we don't have to address it with balloons and stent, they don't work, but postural therapy does. So to run through, at least from the venous perspective, what our experience has been, if you have the valvular type of CCSVI, which is the most common, this is actually a quite effective and durable treatment. If you have a stenosis, it's not as effective, but it's still a reasonable procedure to do. And if you have compressive anatomy, ballooning or stenting have really no role, but, but fortunately we have some alternative therapies that we can get you started on. So, now going back to the vagus nerve, how does this all fit with what's going on with the vagus? Well, as I mentioned, you've got this tubular structure, the sheath, the carotid sheath with all three of these organs passed through. It's very dense fibrous tissue. And if you're going to inflate a balloon, you're going to most likely impact the vagus nerve most of all. How does that work relative to the venous anatomy I just described and the difference in response? Well. If you have a valve, you tend to have, first of all, a larger diameter vein, but more importantly, the vein where you're treating is larger in a patient with a valve. It gets bigger. Like I said, you had valves, so I noticed where your valve was, it bulged outward. So we're gonna use a little bit bigger balloon. If you have a stenotic type, the vein gets smaller where you're gonna treat, you're probably gonna be treating with a smaller balloon. 
So that subtype will be treated with different sized balloons and therefore the potential to compress that vagus nerve is going to be different with the two different anatomies. So my observation that the anatomy itself was explaining the difference in response could be erroneous. It could be we're using a balloon that fits within the carotid sheath and compresses the vagus nerve fully in patients who have the valvular type, whereas the stenotic type, we're using a smaller balloon that does not fully compress the vagus. Again, this is an observation and just a thought. Don't take this as science. All right, so now I'm going to change gears a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if this will be more or less controversy. <laughs> um, we had a recent advisory by the FDA, which I'm sure most of you um, at least heard about, if you haven't read it. And it concerns CCSVI and the safety of the procedure. And I think it's important at least uh, to start, do we understand what, what does the FDA do? Well, in the United States, the FDA is responsible for drugs and devices and for clinical trials. And the important part about the clinical trials is, is that a clinical trial is defined as prospective research. It is not retrospective. It is not a physician, a hospital, or any other entity going back and saying, we did this, we saw this, we treated this, what did we find? Okay? It is not a registry. The FDA has no jurisdiction over registries or retrospective studies. It's a very important fact. Most important, though, and I got lots of emails the day this came out, the FDA does not have anything to do with the practice of medicine. In other words, we're still treating patients just as we were before this advisory came out. This, this does not impact clinical practice of medicine. So let's sort of go through some of the key points in this advisory and, and take a look at what, what they were talking about and, and what was the basis for their conclusions. Well, the first thing is, is they talk about the safety of the procedure. Um, and, and to sort of introduce that topic, they want to, first of all, talk about CCSVI and its relation to MS. And clearly, it was a lot about MS in the advisory. But what they point out is that there is no direct evidence to link MS and CCSVI. Absolutely agree with that. There, there's just not, we cannot conclusively say that. So I have no quarrel with the FDA making that statement. It sort of falls apart from there. Venous stenosis may be seen as normal variants and can be seen in healthy patients. That's the FDA's official US government statement of fact. I have no idea where they came to that conclusion. What is the basis for that? I don't know. The safety and efficacy of using balloon angioplasty in the internal and jugular veins has not been established. Partly true. Okay, the efficacy has not been established. However, an important point which many people are not aware of is balloons are class two. So you actually can get approval by the FDA for the use of a balloon in any particular structure you want, whatever organ it is, just by doing a safety study. You do not have to demonstrate efficacy. So actually, this should be pretty easy to do. We should be able to demonstrate safety of ballooning the jugular veins, unless there's things going on beyond our awareness or control. OK, so looking at the scientific evidence of treating internal and jugular veins, psoriasis veins in MS patients, do you improve their quality of life? Actually, that's one thing we are starting to get data. We are seeing quality of life improved. Did they not see that? Probably not. If you place a stent in a narrow vein, it is something that could cause a problem down the road, worsening the narrowing. That's interesting. I've been stenting veins for over a decade. That's the first I've heard of this. We look at the serious complications that occur with the CCSVI procedure, and we know that you can have serious complications. I've had a patient I treated die, so I know that serious things can happen. And you know, I still feel terrible, terrible about that fact. It can happen, but fortunately it's pretty uncommon. So for a government body to issue such a broad, strong statement about the safety based on 
anecdotal evidence when there are three published safety studies showing it's safe. I certainly don't have any quarrel with the FDA saying this can happen. Yes, when a, when a death happens, you need to take pause and say, does this make sense for me? So I have no problem with them saying that. But to then label this a high risk procedure? Really? Okay. They go on to talk about when considering this treatment, you need to consider the risks and benefits, and they, absolutely that's true. But they want you to go over it with a neurologist who is familiar with MS and CCSVI. My understanding is the only one just retired. So where are you going to go for help? And again, we go to the same sort of topic where they're basically asking us to discuss this with a neurologist. I really don't know many, radi or excuse me, many neurologists that receive training in venous disorders who have any experience with venous disorders. So why would the federal government warn prospective patients to seek expertise from individuals that don't have it? It's interesting. All right, well, let's address, at least from my experience, what we have seen with safety. Fortunately, major complications actually are very unusual, and our results parallel the published studies out there, lending credence to the fact that you know, this, this could be a very safe procedure as long as it's done right, and if we, have if we have trials that can show its efficacy, we may actually be onto something that helps people. We all know examples where people have been helped anecdotally. Let's, let's show this scientifically. From our experience, what we see is that during the procedure itself, the biggest uh, event that will occur during the procedure are those related to the cardiovascular system, changes in blood pressure, or the SVTs. Fortunately, the SVTs um, tend to be asymptomatic. I've had one patient that actually had some symptoms. But these are things that, that we're equipped to deal with, and most centers who do this are obviously equipped to deal with changes in hemodynamics. So they, they are something that we can deal with procedurally. I had a patient have a small stroke after the procedure, and the only way I can explain this is what's called a paradoxal embolus. How you can have an arterial stroke with a venous procedure doesn't make sense any other way, but shunting of a clot from the right side to the left side, and that occurs with congenital heart defects. We now screen patients to make sure that they don't have a congenital heart defect that could predispose them to this. Paraprocedural bleeding is something that occurs. It occurs with any venous procedure. We are recommending full anticoagulation with our patients. So, patients, so of course, there is going to be increased risk associated with that. We do see that clotting occurs within patients who undergo this procedure. And in fact, if you didn't use a blood thinner, if you didn't use anticoagulation, it would be the most likely adverse event. And then there is this issue of occlusions, which we do encounter. And it's my belief that the occlusions are largely due to clots. So we address the occlusion issue with full anticoagulation. So as I mentioned, when you undergo this procedure, the biggest risk you face as far as the likelihood of an adverse event, it is clotting. And so if you're going to undergo this procedure, in my opinion, based on our experience, you have to be placed on a blood thinner, and that is not an antiplatelet agent. Specifically, it's not Plavix. There's no literature supporting the use of Plavix in veins, except for one paper out of Poland, I believe, that showed it didn't work. So it's just one data point, and it's negative. So if you undergo this procedure, make sure you are not put on Plavix. It's not going to help you and it may actually cause some bleeding complications. Anticoagulation with what we use as a factor 10 inhibitor uh, is the easiest to administer, the most well tolerated, and the most effective from our own experience and looking at the literature. And we fully anticoagulated uh, approximately 1,500 patients. So you know, we've done this with a lot of patients and seen what, what happens, at least in our experience. And that is, if you take a patient who has not had the procedure done, if you take a patient who has not had a complication, such as an occlusion that you know, I have to do these sort of elaborate things to fix, when you put them on a factor 10 inhibitor, they don't clot. So it is effective at preventing patients from clotting after undergoing this procedure. We have seen two significant bleeds. So it, it does occur. You can have a significant hemorrhage with this medication, but it is uncommon. And in fact, if you look at the published literature, sorry for the change in slide color, uh, 
our, our results are pretty much are in line with what you see with other factor 10 studies, and that is somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.1% uh, major bleeding complications. So it's certainly an accepted amount, and it's in, light, it's in line with what the published studies have shown. I mentioned to you that unfortunately I did lose one of my patients who underwent this, and as part of that process of dealing with that and figuring out what happened, we recognized that the risk factors play a big role in this, and so that's one of the things we've changed our practice. We're very aggressive with monitoring blood pressure. That was one of the issues this patient, unfortunately, had a increase in blood pressure, and again, I mentioned to you one of the things associated with autonomic nervous system is control of heart rate and blood pressure, and this patient had a rise that occurred on a pre-existing high blood pressure. And it was something that, as a physician, I was not notified and the patient, unfortunately, was discharged from the facility. They had a subdural hematoma, and high blood pressure can lead to that. So we have modified our approach to minimize this risk. It is still there, but by careful screening, we hope to minimize it as best we can. We've identified age, renal impairment, and high blood pressure's risk, so those are the things that we're gonna check. We're gonna make sure that those are either screened out, patient is not placed on a blood thinner, the dose is modified, or things that are controllable, such as blood pressure, are controlled. So that's been our experience with complications, and it again is in line with what is out there with the three studies that are published, and these numbers are acceptable. If you, if you look at any procedure that you undergo on a routine basis, and where I come from, a very common one is liposuction. This has a lower mortality rate than liposuction. I don't know if it's as common here, but it certainly is where I come from. <laughs> so I'd like to summarize in basically talking about dysautonomia. It is a distinct disorder that crosses all the neurodegenerative disorders. It is something that we see. It is well accepted. It has been around for a long time. Autonomic dysfunction has been studied for several decades. It's known to occur with MS. It is a clinical diagnosis. In other words, we don't have to look at your veins to know whether this is something for you. But what's really cool, there's an objective test. We can actually test this. If you look at the R to R inter interval, that's the peaks and valleys of your EKG, a specific peak. If you measure that distance in a normal individual, it fluctuates over time. Your body is constantly adapting to its environment. So it changes the blood pressure, the heart rate, all these variables instantaneously so that you work perfectly. If you have this dysfunction, that's not what goes on. Your heart rate is continuously straight, exactly one set interval between the peaks and valleys, and it doesn't vary. That's an objective data point that can be measured. It can be measured before, it can be measured after. We have something we can actually follow and do some studies and say what happens to this objective data point. So we're actually, you know, we're actually gonna be doing that clinically. We need to now do some studies to look at this. I put on here Doppler is irrelevant and I'm sure that's gonna upset some people. I don't find it useful clinically. I didn't find it useful before and now recognizing the, the autonomic dysfunction component of this and, and knowing that I now have a different test to follow, the only thing I'm gonna order a Doppler for is to make sure that there's no clots. So what is it that we're doing with the procedure? Again, I'm not sure, but one of the things it could be is that we are actually physically manipulating that vagus nerve. So we're, we're doing a procedure in a vein, so it's transvenous vagal modulation. I have no idea if this is really what's going on, but it's, it really makes sense when I look back about the last two years, what we've been doing, what we see. This is a safe procedure, regardless of whether it's modulating your vagus or whether it's fixing your veins, it is safe. We have three published studies clearly showing it's safe, and all the practitioners that I know of have the same experience. It's less than 1% for any significant complication. I think we're ready to move beyond the safety issue. We now need to work on efficacy, and that's not gonna happen without a clinical trial. Unfortunately, it may actually require randomized placebo-controlled trials. I think that's actually, at the very minimum, it's a shame. 
but it's probably going to be what it takes. We have to have that happen. We've got to have that happen, and it's only going to happen with your help. I mean, we are here because of you. Advocacy and activism is why we're here. It's what's going to take us to the next level. So I, first of all, thank all of you, and secondly, I ask that you continue. I'm not quitting. She's not quitting. Don't you quit.